Hey guys, Dave from Nerdarchy, for Nerds by Nerds, and today I'm hanging out with the angry GM, an angry nerd. So uh, hopefully he's extra angry today and riled up. I, I tried to hire some hooligans to go go shake him for me so we could get him in rare form today. Uh, Jesus, I don't need to be shaken up. All you have to do is mention something like metagaming or dwarf beards, and I'm, uh, I'm there. Dwarf beards, huh? What's your, what's your issue with dwarf beards? Dwarf beards are one of my favorite things. Oh, yeah, but go back to the old days when there was the argument as to whether female dwarves had beards, and that was, you know, like this giant topic that everybody was fighting over. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. We're fighting over that? They, they have beards. They're, they're dwarves. They do not. <laughs> uh, are you sure about that? I am 100% positive. We always still debate that. I feel like dwarven women should have beards. <laughs> Hey, listen, you don't need my permission to play your game any wrong way you want, so. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so, uh, what time is it over there? Where, where, where in the world are you coming from? I am coming from Chicago, the Windy Apple, as we call it. Nice. So you guys are like an hour behind us, I think. Yeah, it's 11 a.m. here. Nice. So, so uh, you know, mainly you're a blogger. you got a fantastic site with tons and tons of content on it unfortunately i do not yes. visit it as much as as much as i would like uh actually i can i can even date like the last time i was over there reading something it was the two monsters that are one monster but not like that <laughs> the the, the two-headed two-tailed bifurcated snake article yes that's exactly yes. it the infuriated people on on twitter but i was actually you know, with articles like that, um, I'm really trying to show people how to think about problems. You know, and it's like nobody, it's a question nobody would ask is what is the difference between one monster and two monsters? You, you know, in terms of, yeah, okay, so two monsters have twice as many hit, di or hit points as one monster, they have twice as many actions as one monster, and they can occupy two positions. So if you wanted to make a monster that was twice as powerful as one monster, you would need to be able to accomplish those things or make up for the fact that it couldn't do those things. And that was the whole problem that I was trying to work through is how do you make a more powerful, like a boss monster? Yeah, I, if I remember correctly, like the article was you basically working through that problem. That's exactly it. And I do that because I like to show people how to think. You know, there's, there's a lot of websites out there that will go through and say, here's a piece of advice. This is how you should do it because this is how I do it. And I will say that too. I will say this is how you should do it and this is how I do it because I'm right and you're wrong. But I will also say here's 5,000 words as to how I reached that conclusion. And if you don't like my conclusion, at least now you know how to think through the problem and to hit your own. The secret is I really don't care if people agree with me or disagree with me as long as I get their brains working. So yeah, you take you you know that that's a that's a good point and a and it's very cool that you just walk them through the process. You take them through your process so that they they can either agree or disagree, but at least they know how you got to the conclusion. Right, Are, and they can. You, sorry, no, it's okay. Do you spend much time over at Reddit? Uh, no, I do not go uh, anywhere near Reddit. I just think it'd be a fun place for you. <laughs> occasionally, someone will put up one of my articles on Reddit. In fact, it happens more than occasionally because I am uh, somewhat divisive and trolly, as it were. So occasionally, I will suddenly see some traffic coming in from Reddit, and I'll be like, oh, someone posted one of my articles, and I'll pop over there and watch the fight play out. Um, which is amusing for a few comments, and then the fight generally on Reddit always degenerates into, um, I can't listen to this guy, I don't care how smart he is because he's pretending to be an asshole or he really is an asshole. Um, or, and the other one is, I can't listen to this guy because he censors his curse words. And so he's a child. You actually get that complaint, uh, censoring the, <laughs> the curse. All the time. All the friggin' time. I don't understand it. Like, that is, like, n that's the number two complaint I get about my content is, why do you censor your curse words? Why are you behaving like a child? So I won't ask you why you're behaving like a child, but why do you censor your curse words? Or do you just not curse in your regular, in, you know, everyday life? 
Oh no, I swear like a fucking sailor on leave. But <laughs> um it, that was a decision that I made very early on when I created the angry character who is basically just me amped up to 11. And considering I normally run at about 8, that isn't much of a jump. Um, people would be surprised to know how much of me is actually in angry. But in the end, I wanted angry to be sort of like, um, who was the, the Looney Tunes character? Yosemite Sam, mm -hmm. who's always losing his temper. He's like, oh, you're a fucking flame, flame, freaking pickle. But I wanted to emphasize that he was, in fact, a cartoon character. He's not a real person, you know. So I chose to use Grawlix, you know, the standard comic book swearing as just that sort of signal that, yeah, this, you know, there, this guy is still a character. You know, it draws a line between me and him. No, I, I actually, I like it. And, and that is, that is, there, there's some other things about it that I, I like too, because I've, I've learned through experience. We, we did like one of our first cons running a game and we had fans show up and that was really cool until I'm looking at like 11 year olds and 12 year olds going, Oh my God, they're listening to us. And I'm like looking at their parents, like, Oh my God, how can you let them listen to us? <laughs> what are you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so I, I can totally get that. I mean, we're probably not going to change anytime soon, but we try and, we we shoot for the hard RPG thirteen, you know, or for the hard uh, PG thirteen. Yeah, I sh I should have asked about that before we started. Like, no, no. How many right. f bombs do I get? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we don't, we don't actually count here on Nerdarchy. They just kind of happen when they happen. <laughs> <laughs> I like I, to save them all up and use them for one big thing at the end. It depends, like uh, you know, which one of us is being triggered at the time. Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, my brother who just uh, who just abandoned us and left Nerdarchy to do his own thing. Um, it, whenever the sorcerer would come up, that would be his 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 trigger, and then he would go off. <laughs> That's one I understand, honestly. That and uh, the lore wizard. The lore wizard was another one. Me as a GM, I really don't care that much. I'm like, whatever. You want to be a lore wizard? Be a lore wizard. You want to be an Arakroko? Fly around. I don't care. I just found a great target for the next sleep spell. Except for <laughs> one thing, um, which is gnomes. I actually don't ban anything without a, a good gameplay and table reason to do it. Like I have banned wild magic sorcerers simply because they take so much extra time and cognitive load to resolve their things because there's so many elements to their spells and their abilities that trigger on random elements or specific die rolls that the player has to be watching. Oh, I rolled an odd number or I rolled this or I rolled that, or is it a wild surge? And you always have to have that wild surge table at, or you know, the, the chart at the table. And so that's why I said, you know what? I don't need this speed bump in my game. Every time it's the sorcerer's turn in combat, I know that it's going to take twice as long to cast a spell. It already takes long enough to cast spells, so so I really don't need that crap. Really? I, I mean, we've got one wild sorcerer, and I, don't, I, I really feel it doesn't matter so much. Like, he casts Tides of Chaos, and then I know he's going to get a surge, and I'm like, just your next spell, just surge. So literally, he should know, like, the way I do it anyway, they should just know to have it ready and just roll your percentile dice with whatever dice, other, whatever other dice you're going to roll. Yeah, but sure. Even then it's still, you know, roll the percentile. So roll the, roll the next spell, see if it's successful. Um, resolve that, roll the percentile dice, look over to a chart, you know, read the chart effect and apply the chart effect. It's still, I mean, you're talking a, a small number of seconds, but it, it comes down to, if I can get sort of high level for a second, um, it comes down to the pacing curve in D&D &D being fucked up or screwed up to begin with. Um, in in theater and video or you know video, movies and video games and stuff, there's this concept of a pacing curve, where you know basically throughout the throughout the movie you have building up of tension, building up of tension to a climax, and then it resolves and drops off. And the climax is the point of highest tension. But if you look at individual scenes, individual scenes follow that same thing. A scene starts, tension builds up, the scene hits a climax, and then the action falls off. And every individual choice and action 
also has a pacing curve to it. So in D&D, &D, the, re the resolution of an action is the player makes a choice and makes all the decisions involved in that choice. I'm going to cast a spell. It's going to be this spell. I'm targeting that opponent. Uh, I'm going to apply this meta magic feat or, what, you know, whatever. Makes all those decisions. Then, you know, that's the decision made. Now we have to resolve the action. And that's the moment of highest tension is the die rolling, right? Mm -hmm. So then the die rolls, it hits the table, everybody sees what it does, and then the action should fall away. It should, that was the moment of highest tension. The problem is in D&D, &D, what happens after the die rolls is a bunch of math happens. Uh, oh, I got to add plus two, yada, 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 that's a 17 versus the DC, or, you know, 18 versus the armor class, did it hit? And then the GM has to look and say, yes, it hit, blah, 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 blah. And then then the resolution gets dragged out so that there's action after that moment of highest tension that presents it from falling off and going into the next action. So I try to avoid as much as I can after the die roll. You know, and as much extra stuff after the die roll because it maintains a flow and a pace to the game. So with the Wild Sorcerer, when they search, I feel like all you did is <laughs> move the, the tension. Because actually, generally, well, what happens with that die roll is more fun than whatever the attack roll was. Uh, I would, yes. Yeah, see, I don't disagree, but the point is the moment of highest tension at the table is the die roll itself, the, the dice hitting the table. Every additional step and every level of add complexity after the dice hit the table is drawing out the action past the moment of highest tension. It's sort of like when you roll the dice, you hold your breath, right? It's mm -hmm. like, oh, I got to roll the dice. <gasps> and then the dice hit the table, and then you let that breath go. And you either let it go with a gasp or with a sigh, depending on whether it's good or bad. The longer it takes to find out everything that happened as a result of that die roll, the longer you're holding your breath. So, I hear what you're saying, and I feel it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but at the same time, I guess I guess it depends where you want to focus, right? Why you're playing, why the game's going on. But I can like point to like specific instances in, in my in my game where, granted, with the pacing, what you're talking about is true. Like it's it's an RPG. Like for the most part, unless you're playing a super rules like game. The pacing is always going to be kind of horrible because all these mechanics and math have to happen and it slows things down. But, you know, there's been a couple times like the wild mage surges and a fireball explodes at their feet in a bar, setting the bar on fire because they're standing in front of all this liquor, like creates these great moments in the game. Or the other time they're in the middle of the fight, the wild mage casts a spell, polymorphs himself into a sheep. The next thing you know, my two goblin players are riding the sheep around the battlefield. The sheep is trying to get away from the battle. The the, the goblins are rangers, so they're using animal, ha animal handling to make it stay in the battle. Uh, you know, it's just stuff like that is hilarious to me. And, and sure. you know, obviously um, everybody's different. But, okay, so now how many of those wild surge rolls just dissipate like a fart in the wind? I mean, you gave me two examples of here were some really great wild surge rolls. How many of them don't do that? That, well, that's true. There's a bunch that are kind of like nothing happens or, you know, there's a little bit of a benefit or there's a, a little bit of something that happens. Like, actually, I think the very last one that, that went off was uh, he couldn't talk, so he couldn't cast any spells with a verbal component for the rest of that encounter. All right. I'm going to dare you to do something to prove myself right. Okay. Okay. Next time you're running the game with your wild magic sorcerer, Pre-roll the wild surge. You do it behind the screen with the with the chart. You pre-roll that wild surge so that if the you know the wild surge comes up, you already know the effect. The die roll hits the table, and you just narrate the whole the whole result, including the wild surge. Take out that resolution that comes after the die roll. You will see how much better the action flows. I promise you. Okay. Uh, and that's actually very doable. So, you know, mm -hmm. you pointed out what you perceive as a problem, but it also gave the solution. 
Yeah, that's that's what I do. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm like the Dalai Lama of gaming with more swearing. <laughs> Uh, our staff writer Scott agrees with you. The pacing is horrible in uh, D and D, and I think RPGs in general. Uh, the crunchier you get, the the worse. Yeah, you know, the more broken up it gets. But I also feel like as nerds, though, there's a lot of us that just kind of like that part of it as well. Well, I'm not. Look, there's nothing wrong with crunch, but wouldn't it be interesting if the crunch happened before you rolled the dice? Like if you did decision math and die roll. If you could find a way to do that so that the minute that die hits the table, everybody knows the outcome. You know, like, like what if the players roll, roll the, you tell the players exactly what they need on the die. You know, for example, the player's got a plus six to attack and you know the armor class is 17. So you say, okay, you need an 11 to hit. And you do that before the attack rolls. So then the player rolls. The minute that die hits the table, everybody knows whether the attack hit. Everybody can look at that and go, oh, yes, or crap. You know? The um so so our one GM, he does some he, he kind of does that, but not really, because he always he sets the DCs and they're covered. And then you roll and he uncovers the DC. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of no. the same thing. It's similar, but like I said, the key is the moment of highest tension in any action is that die roll. That's what we're that's where we're holding our breath. The minute the die roll is done, everybody should know what happened. So I guess that that would lead into one of your other pet peeves, though. When you do that, you're going to always have those players that then begin working the numbers, right? I mean, they're already doing it. Like if you knew, even if you don't do that, they're working and looking for their target number, and. You know, oh, 21 miss, but 22 hit, so we know it's a 22. Wait a minute. You said my pet peeve? Do, are you projecting your pet peeve? Metagaming. You already said it. Yeah, you're right. I hate the word metagaming because it's a load of bullshit that GM uh, needs to yell at players for things they don't like. I'm, I stand corrected. <laughs> <laughs> I misinterpreted when you used the metagame. Oh. You know, get, get, go into metagaming for me then. I don't like, agree that that word exists. Like, and I mean, you just gave a perfect example. Mm -hmm. um, the player's working the numbers, trying to figure out the armor class of an opponent, say. So what? So what if the players know exactly what they need to hit? Okay? And why shouldn't they anyway? Any trained combatant is going to look at somebody on the battlefield and say, well, he's wearing armor. He's going to be difficult to hit compared to that guy who isn't wearing armor. And wow, look how he moves. He's really nimble and agile. He's going to be hard to hit. Or that thing has a really thick carapace. It's going to be hard to hit. Or that thing has a magical field around it that's going to make it hard to hit. There is no reason why a combatant, a trained combatant who has a weapon proficiency or a spell proficiency or whatever, can't assess mostly how well their opponent defends itself. I mean, you know, I, I go back to martial arts and fencing because I was a fencer in high school. And one of the things we were trained to do was to read our opponent. You know, as soon as you get on the strip, you start feeling out the opponent so that you know, you know, this is how fast they move. This is their distance. This is all of that crap. That's part of being a skilled combatant. And every character in D&D is a skilled combatant. So end of the day, there's no reason to say, oh, the players can't know the armor class of an opponent. And even if they had that information, all it would do was allow them to make better choices. Like, wow, this guy's going to be really hard to hit. I should use my uber power with extra accuracy. You know? And what's wrong with that? Role-playing games are a game of making informed decisions and exploring the consequences. Players should have the information they need to make the best possible decisions. That absolutely makes sense. Um, and, you know, it's always been something, I guess, that uh, as I, I see other GMs and other players get annoyed with things like that, where actually very little rarely bothers me at the table. It's just my general my, my general uh, lack of empathy for the world at, at large. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> You're very anti-me. You seem to be very mellow about things. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it doesn't matter, man. And a year from now, we'll make a difference is kind of like my philosophy. Well, if if I can throw the other side of metagaming in here, since you already got me started on the rant, I'll use the classic example is the troll situation. 
In D&D, trolls regenerate any damage that doesn't come from fire or acid. Vary, the rules vary depending on the addition, but the basics are there. So you as the GM, you throw a troll on the table, and the players immediately, um, because they know what trolls are, even if their characters have never encountered a troll, they break out the fire, they break out the acid. And then the GM is like, ah, you're metagaming, how dare you? It's like, hold on a second. Number one, so what? You're the idiot as the GM who created a scenario that could be easily broken just by knowledge. Okay, like, uh, you know, this, this troll is, is going to be a difficult challenge unless they actually know anything about it. And as soon as they know something about it, the challenge is broken. Well, if you don't want the challenge broken, you're going to have to do better with your challenges, my good sir. What if the room is filled with flammable gas? Now break out the fire. Are you willing to risk blowing yourself up to do extra damage to the troll? Or do you all back out the room and someone holds the troll in the doorway and then you throw the flask of oil in there? So design a challenge that isn't broken by knowledge. But the second thing is that GMs always fall back on that excuse of, well, it's not realistic. They never encountered a troll. And my point is, you know what? I have never in my life encountered a vampire in real life. And I sure as hell know how to kill them. Like if, if a vampire walked in this room right now, he would be screwed. Okay, I've got garlic in the other room. I've got wooden steaks. I've got everything I need. I have methods of decapitating it. And I have fire. I know all of the tricks. I even have rice if it's like a classic vampire that I can drop on the floor so it has to obsessively compulsively count it. I know all that crap because it's part of my pop culture. And will people say, oh, well, they didn't have pop culture back in the medieval period. And I say, bullshit. Every Greek citizen back in the day or Roman said, no, every Greek citizen back in the day knew the solution to the Sphinx's riddle because it was in a play. You know, every, every Greek citizen knew what a, a manticore or a hydra was because they were in their stories and their mythology. You know, it's not ridiculous to assume that players have a knowledge or the characters have a knowledge of the world they live in and that they've heard these legends and stories. And sure enough, while they were going through their combat training, you know, some of this stuff probably came up. So there's no really good excuse to say, oh, well, they wouldn't know it. And if you fight against metagaming, what you're really fighting against is I'm not allowed to screw my players by saying, yeah, there is a solution, but you're not allowed to use it. Um, and the problem that that enters into with the troll scenario is that, okay, so I have decided the players are not allowed to act on their knowledge that fire will kill trolls because their characters couldn't know it, and I don't want them to break my challenge. So normally if you were in a situation like that where you didn't know how to deal with an opponent, you would be experimenting. You would be trying different things. And then hopefully by serendipity, you stumble on the fire, right? The wizard would throw several different spells. When the burning hand spell was super effective, they'd be like, oh, it's fire. Everybody do fire. The problem is that if it's a scenario where the players know the solution, but the characters don't, and the GM won't let the players use the solution, how many mistakes do the players have to make before the GM says, okay, you fucked up enough that now you can figure out fire? Because there's no organic way for the party to then feel their way through that challenge. They can't accidentally use fire because if they try to cast fire spells, you'll say, no, that's metagaming. So it creates a ridiculous scenario anyway. The whole concept of metagaming is screwed up. The only thing I took away from that is I should definitely put my players in a room with flammable gas and a troll. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, 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 you bring up great, great points. And the truth of the matter is they'll eventually hack the troll to pieces on the ground. It'll keep regenerating. They'll keep hacking it. And likely they would try and do something like set it on fire. So you're absolutely right. It doesn't really matter in the, in the big scheme of things. Uh, right. And if, if you want the troll to be a challenge, find a way that using fire or using acid is, you know, limited. Hey, fire and acid are limited resources in the game. Uh, you know, except for the wizard's one firebolt cantrip that they can throw endlessly. It's kind of hard to keep coming up with fire and acid. So yeah, one troll is easily taken down if the party throws some fire and acid. But what if it's a warren filled with trolls? 
Now they've got to ration that shit. Even that becomes a difficult issue. It's like, wow, there's 50 trolls in here. I don't have enough fireball spells to kill them all. And if we try to relieve and go camp, they're going to chase us. You know? Well, 5th edition, you have unlimited cantrips, so you can burn yeah. them all day. <laughs> you, know, you know, obviously, we can talk edition by edition, but yeah, yeah. When, you, when you're, even that, where you have the unlimited cantrips, that's great. So you have one character in the party that can effectively damage the opponent instead of five. That still hurts. You know? It's like, if only the wizard can hurt the opponent, that's still much more dangerous than anybody can hurt it. So there's some doubts in the chat as to whether or not you would actually be able to take on the vampire. <laughs> oh, tell, tell any wait, I'm not even seeing the chat. Uh, uh, the chat is on the watch page. Um, on YouTube? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, oh. let's, Comic Book University. Big guy says a vampire would be in trouble if he came into the room. <laughs> it's metagaming to say, is it metagaming to say he'd shit his pants in real life? <laughs> Um, actually, <laughs> oops, sorry. I, it's okay. <laughs> I, do, I do that all the time, too. I, I eventually learned to mute it beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> you can teach well, an old first dog. first of all, the vampire stuff. can't even get in here because I didn't invite it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, See, this is the other thing, too. This is what drives me crazy. Okay, chat, screw you all. <laughs> because let me tell you what you just did. I explained a concept, the concept of why metagaming is not something that you should be concerned about and why you should instead focus on building better challenges and chill the freak out at your table. You guys are all just attacking the example. Like, oh, if you disprove the example, you argue the concept. That's not true. I hate when people do that. I write a 5,000-word article explaining this entire thought process, and then someone says, you know, in the first paragraph, um, you use this example, and technically chess is a game of perfect knowledge, so therefore I win, and everything else you said is wrong. No, fuck you. You're still wrong, moron. Get lost. Also, if there are any vampires in the chat, bring it. <laughs> there you go he's called out he's called out the vampires in the chat that's awesome <laughs> maybe i'm a secret werewolf and we all know in that van helsing movie that werewolves are vampires one weakness for reasons <laughs> <laughs> oh that's great uh also as soon as you started using the troll example they started going off with underwater trolls <laughs> <laughs> well, I, the the whole scrag thing was actually exactly that. It was like, okay, now everybody knows trolls. Um, how do we make them, you know, well, we'll make them aquatic. Then they're not flammable anymore. And then, then also we can have endless arguments as to how much um, acid is neutralized in water, which was always a fun thing that came up at the table. It's like, I throw acid in the water. No, it would be neutralized. Well, you know, before it neutralized, it would still do damage, blah, 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 blah. blah. And then, we, then you have the one idiot who's calculating the molar strength of the acid in seawater, and, and then you have to punch them and <laughs> kill their character. I like that solution. Just kill the player. <laughs> not the character. Leave the character. Kill the player. <laughs> no, no, Rocky does not condone murdering your fellow gamers. Uh, do you have a favorite yeah, edition? Uh, Rio Lo Rio Ayu Blue or Rio Lo Lu Blue is saying I'm with you. Time for DMs to get creative, change the weaknesses of the pop culture monster manual. No, that is bullshit. That that is such a phoning it in crap approach. Okay, you come up with a way to work within the monster manual. You take those weaknesses and you put them in situations where those weaknesses create challenges. Okay. No, you just want to shuffle your weaknesses around. Give me your DM screen. You're done. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. No more DMing for you. <laughs> oh, God. You know, if you want to DM, work at it, okay? So I guess, you know, Sorry. I'm not totally against shuffling around the weaknesses, but not for the sake of shuffling around the weaknesses. Like if you're trying to tell a different story or create, you know, a different monster, sure. I mean, we we have a series that we dabble into everyone's so I call fast and dirty monsters. It's basically where we just reskin something or several somethings out of the monster manual to make new monsters instead of like 
doing all the work. It's a cheat. Sure, sure. And there's there's nothing wrong with reskinning to reskin, but when you when you're reskinning to change uh, a monster around because you know your players will have an easier time dealing with it, that's not reskinning anymore. That's called a gotcha. That's that's like you're creating a jack in the box. You know, it, it's a booby trap. It's surprise you're screwed for no reason other than you want to screw the players. Yeah, you're, you know. I, I get I get what you're saying absolutely. The the idea of just oh no, they think it, it, it it's a red dragon, so it's immune to fire or whatever. It's a fire among that does fire damage, but no, my fire among is gonna do cold damage and is going to be immune to cold just because mm -hmm. reasons. And yeah. You know, un unless you can come up with creative story elements that make sense, you're right, it is just a dick move on the DM's part and it and it is lazy. <laughs> not, not that I'm against lazy DMing, because you know, I generally, I generally do most of the stuff off the fly and make it up as I go. Oh, you're one of those. I am absolutely one of those. Prep is for the week. <laughs> well, honestly, though, um, I mean, I have nothing wrong with prep and improvis or uh, with improvisation and no prep because I do that too. But, and that's another thing that I. I try to focus on and that's why I write so much on my website is because people think improvisation is working without a plan or working without prep. What improvisation really is good improvisation is planning and executing at the same time. It's like, okay, uh, you still have to understand things like story structure and challenge and building a good challenge and, you know, and pacing and all that other crap that we talk about. It's just, you have to also be able to pull it off in the moment. Yeah. You know, generally, the, the GM, sorry. generally, I'll just have a premise in my head, or maybe I'll write down three sentences on a sheet of paper, whichever. And that's what I'm going to go for it with for the night, unless <laughs> the players do something else. And then I'm just going to do whatever, whatever they do, I'm going to work, you know, within what they give me, you know, and we'll tell the story together. Mm. Oh, you're, okay, fine. Well, I'm going to leave that alone. Oh, which that, what I said <laughs> or something in the chat. No, it's just the, the whole oh, we, collaborative storytelling bullshit. Yeah, fine. Uh, no, no, let's hear it. Let's hear it. I'm, I'm always open to different uh, takes on it. You don't, you don't like player agency. Um, I have, well, no, I, players have absolute agency over their characters and the choices their characters make. That's fine. And I have no problem with that whatsoever. Whatever the characters want to do, it is my job to respond to it. Um. Player agency beyond the character, though, that completely fucks up with what a role-playing game is. Because now the players are making decisions that don't align with their character's goals. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. Now I'm, I'm really just now getting nitpicky. <laughs> <laughs> well, so here's the thing. Like, I guess we talk about this sometimes, and that is the fact that you... So the, the character can have goals, and the mm -hmm. player can have goals, and you don't actually have to line up. Because sometimes I'll have, I personally have goals for my character that are really fucked up and you would never do to somebody you really like, right. you know, but so they don't line up. So clearly like, you know, you know, even like if you look at fifth edition, like what, what, what player or what character would ever really want to be a warlock if they knew all the ins and outs. Right. But the player wants them to be a warlock because it, it's cool. They're angsty, whatever. They want to tell that story or they want that type of character. But right. you know, a lot of times, being that making that choice isn't really like a great decision for the character, right? But it is still the choice the character would have made. Like, here's the question: Why did the character become a warlock? Well, for whatever reason he did, because there's different reasons. But essentially, you you know, the right. whatever. Well, gift as you a player, you need to understand those reasons. You need to understand the motivations of your character, and then you make decisions based on the decisions the character would make in the world. Well, so all right, let me backpedal a little bit here. So, okay, sure, sure. I make a warlock character. He trades his soul, deal mm -hmm. with the devil, gets power, right? And eventually he goes, oh, I made a bad decision. Actually, it wasn't worth my soul. I want that back, right? So, sure. so that's like a character goal. Well, the player goes, well, if my, if my character gets what he wants, I don't get to play that character the way I, I like to play him. So okay. you, that, you don't really want to Whoa, hold on. Why did you make a character who wants something you don't want to play? 
No, what no, is no. wrong with you? No, no, no. That's not it at all. <laughs> you got it backwards. I made the character I want to play, but if you fix his problem, he's no longer the character you want to play. Have you considered making a character who's not working actively against you? No, never. <laughs> that's insane. Do you, like, um, like, why, why would you create a character who your success and the character's success cannot happen simultaneously? That is, the more the character fails, the more successful you are. Yeah. That's really fucked up. Do you understand that? Sure, but that's you're know, that's, that's that. you basically either sabotaged yourself or your character. Exactly. But that happens all the time. Why it, is your warlock wait wait wait? Why is your warlock's goal not I'd like to get out of the contract but keep the power? Well that would be I mean, a good way to do it. That is a perfect but that's that's the human goal, right? It's like, okay, I gotta find a way to trick myself out of this agreement, but I don't want to give the money back. That is a standard goal. That's a very human thing. And that's a much more engaging and human character. And then again, now your goals align with the characters. Is Yeah, we both want the warlock powers. I just don't want the devil part of it. And now you have a character where you can make decisions and the character can make decisions. And those decisions are going to go in the same direction. And again, I would ask, why did you make that deal with the devil to begin with? Obviously, there was something your character wanted that power with, or obviously your character assumed from the beginning that either the devil wouldn't be a problem or that he could trick his way out of it someday, which are also basically the assumptions that you, the player, made. It's like, I want to play a warlock, but I'm assuming that the GM is not going to screw me because of my character choice. You know, the player and the GM made the same decision there. Or the player and the, the character made the same decision there. So that character actually did get his soul back and he had to keep it externally in order to keep his power. Okay. Um, so it kind of did work out that way anyway, um, the way the GM engineered it. But the way I was playing the character was he was, his goal was to get back his soul. And, but my, you know, when, when I think about that, you know, I think of it being, being like, well, if you do that, then isn't the power going to leave? Mm-hmm. But and, no, you, and you raise a great point. Like, why wouldn't you figure out how to how to keep the power, and you know, and get your soul back? Well, okay. Here's here's the deal. Characters in role playing games are still characters in fiction. Okay, and characters in fiction, fiction and drama are interesting because it is about human motivations. Even if we're playing robots and elves or whatever. Ultimately, what we're really exploring is human interactions and the human condition. Okay. If you are setting up your character to make decisions that do not make sense from a human perspective, then the character is less engaging. If you instead force yourself to confront the same conflicts, internal conflicts that your character would confront, is like, on the one hand, I want to keep the power, but on the other hand, I don't want the devil anymore. Um, that makes for a more interesting character because that character now has an internal conflict to resolve. Internal conflict is what makes choice interesting anyway because the character has to then choose priorities. At the end of the day, your character is like, okay, you can keep your power and you can have your soul back, but you can't put your soul back in your body. Now your character has to weigh the priorities of the I want the power, I want my soul. Is this trade-off worth it? And has to make an interesting and compelling choice. Uh, I agree. I mean, and, 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 you know, you actually made me think about it differently by even asking that question. Yep. I have that power. <laughs> so well done. So real quick, I want to go to the chat for a roll call and then we'll get some, uh, get some questions from these guys. Cause they've been pretty active in there though. The weird thing with the chat is sometimes they're talking with it, with and at us. And sometimes they're just talking amongst themselves. Where are you guys at? We got Chicago with the angry GM. You guys know I'm in Jersey. Uh, so also I have an announcement while I'm waiting for you guys to weigh in with, uh, with the, the roll call today, 5 PM Easter time. I will have David Harbor on from stranger things, uh, uh, suicide squad, quantum assailants and some other things. So I don't think he's going to be on very long. He, he said, he said he'll set aside 20 minutes for us to talk about D and D. So that should be pretty, pretty exciting. So they're starting to weigh in Virginia, Maine, Portugal, Washington State, Canada in the house, Toronto, Seattle, 
Alabama, Texas, Colorado, Texas, Pennsylvania, is Israel. I don't know if we've had any Israels before. Awesome. I'm glad to see you here. Canada, Arizona, uh, Texas, Minnesota, Texas, Fran San Francisco, Pittsburgh, Tampa. Some more Canada in the house. We got New York, Oregon, Denmark, New Hampshire, Texas, Poland, Tampa, Germany. United Kingdom, Oregon, Germany. Jesus Christ, what time is it in these places? <laughs> every time we said, every day, every uh, live chat, I try and set a little, set aside at least a little bit of time to see where people are coming from, and you know, it always amazes me you know, to see people all over the world chi chiming into the, the these things to watch us talk about nerdy D and D stuff. Ireland. Wow, we're pretty international today, man. It must be the angry GM. You're bringing them from all all corners of the world. <laughs> yeah, that, that's it. I am definitely a unifying force for world peace. Everybody says that about me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it's more unified against a common enemy. There, well, maybe we had we had we had a handful of people waiting for this uh, when I when I opened up the uh, the watch page. So. Not my, not Matt Colville levels where they were freaking camping out like a Grateful Dead concert the day before, but <laughs> that that was crazy. I I jumped on, you know, or I must have had the window open and just had left it open, and I looked in the morning at like eight thirty in the morning, my time. So it was like almost four hours before it was supposed to start. They were already in there talking with each other. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's nuts. He, he he's the grateful dead. He must be. He's the Jerry Garcia of uh, of the RPG world. I think. I I could only imagine if it was Matt Mercer. They'd be free, They would have been there like the week before. Jesus, Mercer. <laughs> Another one out there on YouTube teaching people how to do it wrong. <laughs> oh yeah, what's he doing wrong? Let's hear this one. <laughs> oh my God! You know what? I like. I. There is between him and Perkins, I watch their games. And I mean they're they're okay people. And they're fine GMs. But there is so much they have such a tone problem. They're, you know, at times they get so wacky and like I can't take that crap. My game is serious business, damn it. Um so define no, wacky. I, what's what's wacky? Like call something out specific. Oh, it's been a even, while since I watched it. Even if you so. have to make something up though, for an example. Uh, uh, I don't know. You know what? Okay, okay. I, it, this is Perkins' thing, though. This is this wasn't Mercer's because I was watching. Um, he was running these these people through Curse of Strahd, and uh, supposedly they're famous people, but I have no idea who they are because they're not me, and I don't care. Oh. Um, but, but the one girl was playing a paladin, and she decided that her paladin was stupid. Like she she's playing this like bubble headed, airhead, stupid paladin with a southern drawl. And like in these otherwise very serious encounters, she's like flouncing around saying stupid, misunderstood thing, you know, like misunderstanding the situation, making anachronistic jokes, and like completely disrupting the tone of what should otherwise be a serious scene. I, I had to finally leave the room. My girlfriend was watching it, and I had to leave the room. It's like did, why are they letting her do this? She's ruining the tone of the game for everybody else. And it's that kind of crap. Everybody thinks, oh, well, you know what? A joke is good anywhere. It's No, no. A joke is not good anywhere. There's a time to shut up, stop laughing, and weep a little bit because your character's just got three children killed, and now you have to go tell the parents that their kids are dead and bring them the bodies. Not that's a situation that has come up in my games repeatedly. That's harsh. <laughs> I I did go through a, a period where I was running three different groups at the same time, you know, three different games. And just by a weird quirk of coincidence, in all three games in the same month, children were killed or, or people were killed and the players all found themselves in situations where they had to go to the loved ones and, you know, basically deliver the news. One of them involved children that had been torn apart by Knowles as a direct result of the players screwing up. Um, and another one was this this girl's girlfriend was was killed. And hey, 
Oh, they didn't. They didn't know they were they were lovers. So that was just a surprise for when they were delivering the news. They thought they were just friends. Um, yeah, it just it's just one of those weird things that it just came up in three games at once. I was just sorry. I was just distracted by the uh, by the chat, but um, I, I actually made my first player cry. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, uh, "Oh no, what do I do?" No, um, so I was running a scenario where they needed to acquire material components from from these hags, and so mm-hmm. said player was actually like, "Oh, this is going to be one of those deals like fairy tale where you know we're not just going to be able to go and." harder for stuff to get stuff and i was like huh yeah that's exactly what it is now um so they they had to give up something personal and it was it was going to be a memory it was it was the hags were going to take a memory from each of them in order for them to get what they wanted so they they kind of did this ritual and the player had started the game with with their uh with the riding mask that was a halfling and you know, so what I did is I had each player describe the memory, and it was only like afterwards that I told them that they were that they were going to lose that memory, that they didn't have it anymore. So after the ritual was completed, you know, I described her looking at her 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 dog and not not knowing who it was, and you know, feeling connected to it, but not knowing why. And like, kind of went through like a kind of little bit more of a drawn out thing. And she got a little emotional. I was like, oh, my God. I just made someone cry in a game. <laughs> but uh, so I guess that's what you're talking about, more like serious, less dick jokes. Well, you know what, though? No, honestly, what it comes down to is it's tone, right? I mean, every you you have a horror movie, and it has a certain tone to it. It is about dread. It is about disempowerment. It is about isolation. That doesn't mean that there's never a light moment where the the characters can relax a little bit, or that they they even share a laugh occasionally. But for the most part, um, you you wouldn't want to have a horror movie where suddenly one of the characters shows up in a jester costume and is slapping everybody with rubber chickens every other scene. It would screw with the tone. Um, you know, it and I I just tend to run a more serious tone. I uh, you know I run I run Lord of the Rings and not like I can't think of a good fantasy parody. Oh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. I'm running Lord of the Rings, not Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And if Sir Lancelot or Sir Robin showed up in Lord of the Rings from Monty Python and the Holy Grail, everybody sitting in that movie theater would go, "What the hell just happened? This is totally emotionally jarring." So, you know, and as a GM, it is your job to control the tone at the table to, you know, to figure out the tone everybody wants to play. I'm not just saying, you know, pick your tone and do it, but figure out the tone that everybody is into. And if it reaches a point where somebody's character is utterly disruptive of that, uh, you pull them aside and say, listen, um, your little stand-up comedy act here. Uh, does not jive with this tale of a tortured vampire who is desperately seeking a replacement for his lost love. Sorry, just doesn't work. You know, come back, come back with an actual emotional character. Uh, you know, and people are saying in the chat session zero and you know social cr- contracts and all of that stuff. You know, prior you know, to the, the game, the standard bullshit terms that people throw out when you say this stuff, like they mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, you know, I think it helps, or at least if people are going to go off the rails and try and do their own thing, you have something to point back to and say, "Well, this is what we all agreed to." Yeah, but yeah. you know what? Like, like player, like people throw out the word "social contract," like, "Oh, you know, you have to the social contract, the social contract." Like, that's advice. That is not advice. Okay, there is nothing actionable about saying, "Oh, the social contract." Don't forget the social contract, because no shit. Every time people get together with a common goal, there is an implied social contract. Okay? That's, that's not a thing in gaming. That's just a human thing that we all understand. That doesn't help anybody. What helps people is when you do have that character who's going off the rails and fucking up your tone, that you can say to the, the GM, okay, this is what you have to do. You have to pull the player aside, 
And you have to say to them exactly this and exactly why. And you yourself have to understand why this is a problem. Just yelling the word social contract at people are saying, did you know there's a social contract in gaming is useless advice. And yet I see article after article that just talk about the social contract in gaming for 2,000 words. By the way, there's a social contract. No shit. Give me something practical and actionable. Uh, I'm just laughing because because your fans are showing up. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the Stockholm syndrome victims. Uh, yo, uh, so you had said you're about to start a new campaign. Are you are you playing? Starting? Uh, are you going to be a player or running it? Oh, I am far too clever, creative, witty, and handsome to be a player. Um, so <laughs> I don't play. I haven't played in a long time. Okay, you know, like once or twice a year, I will play in a short game, but I have no interest in playing. I'm too good at the game to be a player. Interesting. And honestly, even more, I'm too good at being a GM to waste myself on the other side of the screen. Um, you know, the world needs great GMs, so I would be doing a disservice to everyone if I didn't run the game. Um, what I'm actually running is an online D&D 5th edition campaign for 30 people. 30 people at the same time? No, not at the same time. <laughs> it's the same campaign. Um, I've set up for my high-level Patreon supporters... I promised them a while ago that I would figure out a way to run a game, run games for them online. And I've come up with a formula that will allow me to allow all of them to participate in an ongoing campaign, even though, um, even though the, the individual players might only play in one session a month, there is a guild setup that allows them to communicate between games and pay attention to the larger ongoing story. Okay, so how are you? How are you uh, finagling that? How are you, like, so how many? So thirty players, once a month. But, you know, you run in six groups, five groups. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's five to six, five to six sections a month, which is certainly manageable at four four hours a piece. Um, and you know, the basically the players are members of an organization, uh, you know, a guild or what have you. Uh, you know, Rebel Alliance, doesn't matter what excuse you use, you know, because the premise is just an excuse for the gameplay structure. So, and there are missions that get, that publish that the players can volunteer for. Um, they show up on that day, they play through the mission, the successes, failures, and discoveries they make affect the ongoing story, and they can communicate with the other players about the, you know, what happened in their mission, so that if the players pay attention to all the ongoing debriefings and everything else, they can tease out what else is going on and recognize the villains and and then take actions and make decisions in later missions to to bring the story to some sort of a conclusion. I'm being a little bit vague because it's still somewhat experimental. I'm try this is something to see if it will actually work. So I've let in 15 of the 30 players for the first season, which will be about two months long. Are you uh, recording these games, or are these going to be private? These are private. It's just okay. for me and my patrons. I don't do live, uh, you know, actual plays and stuff. It's like my my games are there for me to enjoy it with my players. Um, you know, when, once you start broadcasting the stuff, you become cognizant of the audience and you're trying to give them the most entertaining time possible. And I find that that doesn't always jive with running the best game possible for the players. So I, I can see that, but we, we run games, but we really don't worry about that. We just run the games we're going to run, to be honest with you. And, mm -hmm. you know, we might we may like, uh, cut down on certain things just because it's annoying for the game, but it still focuses on the game. We do, we actually do a similar thing with like the guild you're talking about. We have the company, the nag, and it's just the mercenary band that we, it, it's an excuse to have the players come together every month and they're different players and we don't have to figure out how they got there. They're all part of the same group, you know, and that's where they get their, their quest missions from whatever, whatever is going on. Yeah. And, uh, and that, we, that was exactly where I started with, but I also want the, the thrill of sort of an ongoing campaign where there is where there is a, a meta plot, a greater plot that the missions tie into that the players can then affect. 
So that's where it sort of requires me to allow communication through an online group between the different players that can inform their decisions and you know let them solve these mysteries. So uh, what kind of theme do you got going on? Is there anything you t uh, tell me about that uh, without like spoiling it if your you know players are watching or whatever? Uh, sure. So currently it, it is it takes place in a city that for whatever reason appears to have a mind of its own. The city was recently discovered. It's basically it's the ruins of an ancient city. And this lord became obsessed with resettling it and rebuilding it. Um, and the city has its own influences. It has its own agenda, apparently. And there are certain magical things that it can do. And because it seems to be a source of great magical power and also ancient mysteries, you know, because it's one of these... Si you know, ancient cities were built on top of themselves. You know, ruins on top of ruins on top of ruins. Um, so various groups um, and factions are all trying to seize control of whatever is the source of the magical power in this city. Um, the, the players are basically in sort of a um, goodish aligned adventurer guild type setup where they just take on general jobs for the population. But of course the different factions are tugging them in different directions. Cool. Sounds like an interesting backdrop for some adventures to go on. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. So I just uh, the sentient city. We, yeah, we um we we run like we run three live games, and then we mm -hmm. do like we do uh, two. We have two long going fifth edition games, which have been a lot of fun. They've been going on for like two years now. But it's the same thing. We only we only play like once a month for each campaign. So it it's really, I know you you're the prof you're a professional DM and you like DM it, but we actually like playing as well. So uh, I, I it took me many years to actually cultivate my other nerd artist Ted to start to start running regular games. Mm. Uh, but you know, so we do three games, and you know, two of them are D and D games, and we have a third game which is always short sessions. Uh, our friend Scott will come in and run for us, and he's got this. He's got this weird thing. It's like three, five, seven sessions, and that's like the arc, and then it's done. Move on to the next thing. He, he also believes a uh, he also believes a a uh, a game should be able to run in the length of a movie, which he has not successfully done yet. But but that is one of his objectives. So we we we'll, we'll use that third game to actually play things other than Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. Gasp! But uh. So we, we try and use the channel, like, you know, while D&D is, like, our main thing, we like to throw out some other things, introduce the fans to other games, other genres, other systems, let them know there's things other than D&D out there. Because I'm sure, I'm sure you get this question all the time, too. Anyone that creates a lot of content, they always want to, like, how do I play Star Wars with Dungeons and Dragons? How do I play this with Dungeons and Dragons? And, like, my answer is always, like, kind of the same. Like you don't. Dungeons and Dragons can only do one thing good, and that's Dungeons and Dragons. So, fair enough. Yeah, I, I will say Dungeons and Dragons can do several things good. They are all different iterations of Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, like so there's so many great systems out there. I was like, well, why don't you just use that system? Like mm -hmm. Star Wars, there's like a half a dozen Star Wars systems designed to play that game you want to play. Yeah, and some <laughs> of them are actually good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Have you checked out the uh, the latest iteration of the Star Wars? What the Fancy Flight Games one? The, yes. the Fistfuls of Dice Revolution. Yes, that one. Yeah, it's it's okay. I don't hate it. Really, I'm surprised. <laughs> I'm a little disappointed. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> because uh, well, that, that's one people lo seem to love to hate because of the proprietary dice. I know I've got a satchel of them around here somewhere. Else. Yeah, we we did a campaign of that. That was fun. I enjoyed it. It's uh, definitely if you like a crunch heavy game, that that you know that 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 would be your jam. Mm -hmm. So do you do you have a favorite edition of D and D? Um, Jesus, no. You know what? <laughs> uh, it's hard for me to say because, um, okay, I I have least favorite editions of D and D, but I like the current editions of D and D. 
like uh, it's I'm like looking at my shelf like that's gonna tell me the answer. <laughs> um, obviously, I spent the most time in third edition. Um, and you know, I have a soft spot in my heart for third edition. Um, I also have nostalgia goggles for second edition because I grew up on second edition, but objectively speaking, it's a terrible system. You know, it's before we invented design elegance. So, you know, and third edition, see, okay. So here's the thing. Fifth edition is the edition that I want to say is my favorite, but I have as much as I like it. I like 5th edition. It's a fun game. It's easy to play and all that stuff. I have very little respect for it. Because both 3rd edition and 4th edition were in their ways revolutionary. In, in the whole, you know, in the lifespan of D&D. 3rd edition revolutionized a lot and 4th edition revolutionized a lot. I like 3rd edition. 4th edition, while it did a lot of really, really, really neat and cool things added together, it didn't work as a whole. Fifth edition um, is a disappointing cop-out. It's it sort of just rolled back everything. It's trying to just recapture the nostalgia. Um, it And it was basically um, innovation through subtraction. It was just like, how much can we take out and still make it D&D? Let's just boil it down to its essence. And that's neat, and it makes for a very simple, very playable game, but it's also hard to respect that as a piece of design. And on top of that, the actual product of the of fifth edition, the, the rule books themselves, are really poorly organized and terribly done. They are very low quality publications. So, so. Yeah, I totally, I totally get all they did really with fifth edition was take the nostalgia and kind of the better and more interesting parts of all of the editions and put them in one book. Which, mm -hmm. while it makes for a great game to play and fun, you're right. They didn't, they there was no risk taking. They, you know, they didn't push any envelopes. You, you know, even with fourth edition, I know it was very divisive and people hate. There's a lot of people that hated it and there's a lot of people that loved it. But at the same time, like they definitely took some risks and and made some jumps there that I feel like people should, at the very least, respect them for that. Well, Even if they weren't happy with the end product. Well, the, the sad reality is um, everyone, especially gamers, will say how much they love innovation. But the truth of the matter is everybody just keeps buying the things that are familiar. You know, and, and, it's, and that's just human nature. We want innovation because we want to experience new things, but at the end, we always end up going back to what's comfortable. Uh, someone in the chat, 5e is amazing for new players. It is actually a really good system for new players. It's, it's easy to pick up. It's easy to, it's easy to learn. It's easy to play. It's got some of the cool components from 3rd edition and 4th edition and all, that, and all the nostalgia from you know, AD and day. Um, uh, so... Though in terms of the actual um, performance, 4E was, you know, kicked 5th edition's ass in terms of four new players. And in fact, it was very new player focused. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was definitely much easier to, to use. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, everything worked the same. They're, you know, they're... With even in 5th edition, there's different rule sets depending on what kind of, cla what kind of character you're playing. Where fourth edition, they kind of boiled it down to basically one one rule one rule set for everybody. Right. Yeah. You know, everything was spelled out. Everything was straightforward. There was only one dice mechanic. Um, whereas fifth edition went back to the two and a half dice mechanics that third edition had, which is I still don't understand that choice. I still don't understand why saving throws are still a thing. What would you, would you uh, do you prefer defenses instead? Yeah, actually that, that made a lot of sense. You know, third edition came along and said, okay, you know what? We have too many different dice mechanics in this game because you're rolling different dice for every, like um, 
In second edition, by the time they added like all the non-weapon proficiencies and the other stuff, you know, so you would roll a d20 for attack rolls. If you were attempting to use a, a proficiency, you would roll 3d6, and you were trying to roll under the ability score. If you're trying to find a secret door, you would roll 1d6, and if it was a one or a two, you found the secret door. And for initiative, you would roll, I think it was a d10 in second edition, if I remember correctly. Blah, blah, blah. So there were all these different dice mechanics going on. And third edition said, what if, like, let's get rid of all that crap, invent one dice mechanic, you know, the d20 roll, d20 plus ability score plus other modifiers, compare it to a result, you're always trying to roll high and you're always trying to roll the same thing. Fine and dandy. And what that really did was it, it put, there was a logic that came into the di dice at that point. It was like, if you are attempting an action, whatever that action is, if you're attempting to bring about change in the dice, in the world, you are touching the die. You are rolling the die to exert your will on the world. And then, for whatever reason, somebody had a brain aneurysm and said, what if sometimes you had to roll a die to not let someone else do things? You know, like if a wizard's casting a spell, sometimes the wizard rolls an attack roll, but sometimes you, you roll and I fucked up your, roll, your spell roll. You know, and that became the saving throw. And the saving throw is a really odd odd little creation in third edition. And I understand that it's it's historic because D&D always had saving throws, but they went so far with making one universal dice mechanic and then they backed it off at the last second for saving throws. And fourth edition said, you know what? Let's just finish the job. Um, you know, you have the fortitude reflex and will defense. And when you're taking, if you are taking an action, you roll the dice. And you're compare if you're taking an action against a creature, you're going to compare it to one of their defenses. And it's basically just a reverse saving throw. And then for whatever reason, fifth edition said, nah, we gotta have the saving throws back again. So that sometimes you roll to do things and sometimes you roll to screw someone else up from doing them. Yeah, it's just it's it's a pet peeve of mine because it just comes down to a little bit of design elegance. There's no reason that wizards can't just roll the die for all their spells. You know what? And, and for that matter, like every time the fighter does something, they get to roll the die to make it happen. Sometimes when the wizard does something, the enemies get to roll the dice and the wizard just gets to sit there and watch the dice being rolled. Why is that? Wouldn't the wizard want to roll the die? I'm casting a sleep spell. I want to roll the dice. You know? So it's just, it's just such a weird little quirk of mine. It is. Mutants and Masterminds, which is based off of third edition they they did they, they did do that they went to all defenses with um mm -hmm. with, with their system although their 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 hit point system is really weird but yeah well that was, it was based on durability saving throws and the better you did on the saving throw the more the consequences of being attacked were or the worse you know it, it's it, yeah. it's a game i enjoy playing but i found that people that came from D D and wanted to do hit point damages really struggle with that system. Well, you know, part of that too is that hit point damage just would not work in a superhero game. No, it, it you know, doesn't make sense. Uh, superheroes are highly resilient and they they bounce back from damage, you know, from scene to scene. You know, Batman gets clobbered repeatedly by Bane in one scene, and in the next scene, Batman has recovered and he is able to do it again. And you know, it doesn't really make sense to start ticking down an attrition clock on a superhero because they don't work that way. Well, yeah, and just the same way, you know, it, I don't know if you play theater of the mind or if you do minis, but minis do not work well in a superhero game at all either. <laughs> when you're, <laughs> when your hero can run around, literally run around the world and around it makes it a little pointless. Yeah. I mean, and, uh, you know, especially because theater of the mind, I, I, even though I hate that term, I'll just use it. Theater of the mind is certainly much more cinematic. It's much more set piece focused than, um, than grid based. Well, and you know what, this is the thing too, like the part of the reason why I hate, hate saying theater of the mind versus grid based is you can do theater of the mind in D and D, but you're not really because the grid is still there, you're just imagining it in your head, because the entire game of D&D is measured out in five-foot squares. Every range, um, what you can interact with, it's all defined by precise precision. 
uh, uh, precise positions. So even if you say, yeah, I'm running D&D as theater of the mind, no, you're really not. You're just imagining the grid in your head. It's still a gridded game. Well, and it is designed that, from that perspective. That's one of the, the hoodwinks of going from fourth to fifth, right? Like if you really dissect a lot of the fifth edition stuff, the fourth, their fourth, there's a lot of fourth edition in there. They just change the words to mm -hmm. confuse all the angry people. <laughs> mm. <laughs> no pun intended, but uh, yeah, like every, they they moved everything to five foot instead of and instead of you know calling it out like they like they did in fourth edition, they just give a range. But the ranges well, are still five foot increments. Well, let's let us all also keep in mind that th that was not new to. Fourth edition, either third edition, was also measured out in five foot squares. Yeah, they, Every, it was started there. You know. Well, I mean, fourth edition, you open up your your three point five players handbook, and at the back of the book, you find templates for all the spells. There, there's actually a whole whole discussion in the spellcasting chapter on this is the shape of spell templates, and you would not need that if your world was not marked out in five foot squares. Well, yeah, it started in third, but then fourth, instead of saying the distance, it would say two squares, three squares. And, and I, found, I think a lot of players found that jarring, even though they were already doing it. I don't understand why. Yeah, uh, the square was just an abstraction of five foot. But they, they five, basically just made the grid. They just were, put the wording right in there instead of going, instead of saying the extra numbers, it's like, well, no, you're really just pushing them back three squares because that's honestly, what we're doing. It didn't even start in third edition. If you go back to the earliest of editions, everything was measured in inches because those were inches of table measurement. Um, second edition moved away from the inch measurements. And even, even some of first edition moved away from the inch measurements. But second edition, um, in, when it went into the player's option era, uh, because they were testing stuff for third edition, um, they added the combat and tactics rulebook, which was basically a more rigorously grid-based approach than a table measurement approach. So that that was really the shift between it. But there's always been rigorous measurement in D&D. People just don't like to admit it. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And, and the truth of the matter is, even before we went to minis, we would play with Kit Kats and dice. You know, six-sided dice were the, the enemies and four-sided dice were your heroes. And, you know, we draw our own grids. You know, can I go off on something? Because you bring up a really good point, and this drove me crazy in 4th edition. Okay. When I was a kid and still playing 2nd edition and basic d and you know, back back in the basement in 1988 and 1989, um, eventually I got, a, got my hands on one of those vinyl battle mats, which was really cool because you could draw the map on it with the wet erase markers. And, and from there we started using little, like, paper cutouts. I would cut out little paper squares, and you would label them with the different things, and you would move them around on the map, yada, 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 yada. I used that for two-thirds of my combat through second edition, even before the combat and tactics stuff, through third edition, and then 4th edition came around, and I actually started collecting miniatures with 4th edition because I started to like miniatures and, you know, I had money. So, <laughs> so I built up an extensive miniature collection. But everybody started flipping out in 4th edition. like, oh my god, this game requires miniatures. You have to spend so much money on miniatures. It's the only way you can play because you can't play without a grid. And I'm like, wait a minute. Just because the game needs a grid and tokens does not mean you need miniatures. For years, you, you know, do Skittles, do M&Ms. People have done that for years. It's like suddenly people forgot that there was anything else you could use other than buying the plastic miniatures on, on printed maps. It's like, guys, we've been doing this. For, you know what? Even before that, you know, sometimes in really early editions, you would take out a piece of paper and the GM would sketch the room out and say, okay, this is what the room looks like because it's a complicated layout. It's not a square. And here's the stuff and here's where you guys are and here's where the goblins are. Uh, what do you want to do? And they would update that little map. You know, it's not like suddenly it had to be plastic miniatures. People just flipped out. People lost their goddamn minds. Dude, you totally ninjaed me because I was going to, I was going to circle back to that because that's oh. definitely what, what we used to do when I was, you know, a teenager between the DM, like for the complicated battles or break out the paper, we would do X's and O's <laughs> like football, like a football team and, 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 you know, figure it out that way. Right. And but we we gamers have been finding those solutions since time immemorial. You well know? yeah, because you you'll have a dick DM that'll attack the mage in the back with his ogre 
and you're like, well, how did he get past all the rest of us? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, absolutely. Anyway, I got to cut this short because I do have an appointment that I'm probably running late for. But uh, yeah, we usually run about an hour, and we're about an hour and 20 minutes or so. And uh, we've yeah, had, I was going like, to comment on you saying you're cutting it short because I, I thought we went over time. Yeah, yeah, we did. <laughs> a sol we, we had a solid 130, 140 people all along. Uh, they, they love to come and hate that angry. <laughs> yeah, I get that a lot. But they all know I'm right. <laughs> they hate me because I say the things that everybody's thinking. Yeah. Well, I do appreciate you coming on. Open invitation. You can come back. Uh, you can come back and rile up the fans anytime you like. No, I would love to come back. It's been a lot of fun. It was great getting to chat with you. I, I, I love your site. Um, I don't really watch your streams as much as I should, but the site itself is, is really, is, you know, it is the second best RPG gaming website out there, I think. Oh wow, that's high praise. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> especially because I'm I'm the I'm the chimpanzee pushing the buttons, and mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm doing at all. I just push buttons until it does what I want. <laughs> sort of constantly breaking things and having to fix this. I really appreciate the compliment, um, and thanks for hanging out, everybody in the chat. Thanks for hanging out with us. We appreciate it. Everybody have a great day. Until next time, stay nerdy. So I chose to use Grawlix, you know, the standard comic book swearing as just that sort of signal that, yeah, this, you know, there, this guy is still a character. You know, it draws a line between me and him. No, I, I actually, I like it. And, and that is, that is, there, there's some other things about it that I, I like too, because I've, I've learned through experience. We, we did like one of our first cons running a game and we had fans show up and that was really cool until I'm looking at like 11 year olds and 12 year olds going, Oh my God, they're listening to us. And I'm like looking at their parents like, Oh my God, how can you let them listen to us? <laughs> what are you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So, so, so I, I can totally get that. I mean, we're probably not going to change anytime soon, but we try and, we, sh we shoot for the hard RPG-13, you know, or for the hard uh, PG-13. Yeah, I, sh I should have asked about that before we started. Like, no, no, how many F-bombs do I get? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we don't actually count here on Nerdarchy. They just kind of happen when they happen. <laughs> <laughs> I like to save them all up and use them for one big thing at the end. It depends, like, uh, you know, which one of us is being triggered at the time. Uh <laughs> You know, uh, my brother who just uh, who just abandoned us and left Nerdarchy to do his own thing. Um, it, whenever the sorcerer would come up, that would be his 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 trigger, and then he would go off. <laughs> That's one I understand, honestly. That and uh, the lore wizard. The lore wizard was another one. Me as a GM, I really don't care that much. I'm like, whatever. You want to be a lore wizard, be a lore wizard. You want to be an arrow croak, fly around. I don't care. I just found a great target for the next sleep spell. Except for <laughs> one thing, um, which is gnomes. I actually don't ban anything without a, a good gameplay and table reason to do it. Like I have banned wild magic sorcerers simply because they take so much extra time and cognitive load to resolve their things because there's so many elements to their spells and their abilities that trigger on random elements or specific die rolls that the player has to be watching. Oh, I rolled an odd number, or I rolled this, or I rolled that, or is it a wild surge? And you always have to have that wild surge table at or you know, the, the chart at the table. And so that's why I said, you know what? I don't need this speed bump in my game. Every time it's the sorcerer's turn in combat, I know that it's going to take twice as long to cast a spell. It already takes long enough to cast spells, so so I really don't need that crap. Really? I, I mean, we've got one wild sorcerer, and I, don't, I, I really, like generally well, what happens with that die roll is more fun than whatever the attack roll was. Uh, I would... Yeah, see, I don't disagree, but the point is the moment of highest tension at the table is the die roll itself, the, the dice hitting the table. Every additional step and every level of add complexity after the dice hit the table is drawing out the action past the moment of highest tension. 
it's sort of like when you roll the dice, you hold your breath, right? It's mm-hmm. like, oh, I gotta roll the dice. <gasps> and then the dice hit the table, and then you let that breath go. And you either let it go with a gasp or with a sigh, depending on whether it's good or bad. The longer it takes to find out everything that happened as a result of that die roll, the longer you're holding your breath. So I hear what you're saying, and I feel it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but at the same time, I guess, I guess it depends where you want to focus, right? Why you're playing, why the game's going on. But I can like, point to like, specific instances in, in, my, in my game where, granted, with the pacing, what you're talking about is true. Like, it's, it's an RPG. Like, for the most part, unless you're playing a super rules-like game, the pacing is always going to be kind of horrible because all these mechanics and math have to happen and it slows things down. But, you know, there's been a couple times like the wild mage surges and a fireball explodes at their feet in a bar, setting the bar on fire because they're standing in front of all this liquor, like creates these great moments in the game or the other time they're in the middle of the fight, the wild mage casts a spell, polymorphs himself into a sheep. The next thing you know, my two goblin players, are riding the sheep around the battlefield. The sheep is trying to get away from the battle. The, the, the goblins are rangers, so they're using animal, ha- animal handling to make it stay in the battle. Uh, you know, it's just stuff like that is hilarious to me. And, and sure. you know, obviously um, every but, game's different. But, okay, so now how many of those wild surge rolls just dissipate like a fart in the wind? I mean, you gave me two examples of here were some really great wild surge rolls. How many of them don't do that? That, well, that's true. There's a bunch that are kind of like nothing happens or, you know, there's a little bit of a benefit or there's a, a little bit of something that happens. Like, actually, I think the very last one that, that went off was uh, he couldn't talk, so he couldn't cast any spells with a verbal component for the rest of that encounter. All right. I'm going to dare you to do something to prove myself right. Okay. Okay. Next time you're Hey guys, Dave from Nerdarchy, for Nerds by Nerds, and today I'm hanging out with the angry GM, an angry nerd. So uh, hopefully he's extra angry today and riled up. Uh, I, I tried to hire some hooligans to go go shake him for me so we could get him in rare form today. Uh, Jesus, I don't need to be shaken up. All you have to do is mention something like metagaming or dwarf beards, and I'm, a, I'm there. Dwarf beards, huh? What, what's, your, what's your issue with dwarf beards? Dwarf beards are one of my favorite things. Oh, yeah, but go back to the old days when there was the argument as to whether female dwarves had beards, and that was, you know, like this giant topic that everybody was fighting over. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. We're fighting over that? They, they have beards. They're, they're dwarves. They do not. <laughs> uh, are you sure about that? I am 100% positive. We always still debate that. I feel like dwarven women should have beards. <laughs> Hey, listen, you don't need my permission to play your game any wrong way you want, so. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so, uh, what time is it over there? Where, where, where in the world are you coming from? I am coming from Chicago, the Windy Apple, as we call it. Nice. So you guys are like an hour behind us, I think. Yeah, it's 11 a.m. here. Nice. So, so uh, you know, mainly you're a blogger. you got a fantastic site with tons and tons of content on it unfortunately i do not yes. visit it as much as as much as i would like uh actually i can i can even date like the last time i was over there reading something it was the two monsters that are one monster but not like that <laughs> the, the the two-headed two-tailed bifurcated snake article yes that's exactly yes. it the infuriated people on on twitter but i was actually you know, with articles like that, um, I'm really trying to show people how to think about problems. You know, and it's like nobody, it's a question nobody would ask is what is the difference between one monster and two monsters? You, you know, in terms of, yeah, okay, so two monsters have twice as many hit, di- or hit points as one monster, they have twice as many actions as one monster, and they can occupy two positions. So if you wanted to make a monster that was twice as powerful as one monster, you would need to be able to accomplish those things or make up for the fact that it couldn't do those things. And that was the whole problem that I was trying to work through, is how do you make a more powerful, like a boss monster? Yeah, I, if I remember correctly, like the article was you basically working through that problem. 
That's exactly it. And I do that because I like to show people how to think. I feel it doesn't matter so much. Like, he casts Tides of Chaos, and then I know he's going to get a Surge, and I'm like, just your next spell, just Surge. So literally, he should know. Mm -hmm. Like, the way I do it anyway, they should just know to have it ready and just roll your percentile dice with whatever dice over whatever other dice you're going to roll. Yeah, but sure. Even then it's still, you know, roll the percentile. So roll the, roll the next spell, see if it's successful. Um, resolve that roll the percentile dice, look over to a chart, you know, read the chart effect and apply the chart effect. It's still, I mean, you're talking a, a small number of seconds, but it, it comes down to, if I can get sort of high level for a second, um, it comes down to the pacing curve in D&D being fucked up or screwed up to begin with. Um, in in theater and video or you know video, movies and video games and stuff, there's this concept of a pacing curve, where you know basically throughout the throughout the movie you have building up of tension, building up of tension to a climax, and then it resolves and drops off. And the climax is the point of highest tension. But if you look at individual scenes, individual scenes follow that same thing. A scene starts, tension builds up, the scene hits a climax, and then the action falls off. And every individual choice and action also has a pacing curve to it. So in D&D, &D, the, re the resolution of an action is the player makes a choice, and makes all the decisions involved in that choice. I'm going to cast a spell. It's going to be this spell. I'm targeting that opponent. Uh, I'm going to apply this meta magic feat or what, you know, whatever. Makes all those decisions. Then, you know, that's the decision made. Now we have to resolve the action. And that's the moment of highest tension is the die rolling, right? Mm -hmm. So then the die rolls. It hits the table. Everybody sees what it does. And then the action should fall away. It should... Uh, that was the moment of highest tension. The problem is in D&D, what happens after the die rolls is a bunch of math happens. Uh, oh, I got to add plus two, yada, yada, yada. That's a 17 versus the DC or, you know, 18 versus the armor class. Did it hit? And then the GM has to look and say, yes, it hit, blah, 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 blah. And then, then the resolution gets dragged out so that there's action after that moment of highest tension that presents it from falling off and going into the next action. So I try to avoid as much as I can after the die roll. You know, and as much extra stuff after the die roll because it maintains a flow and a pace to the game. So with the Wild Sorcerer, when they search, I feel like all you did is <laughs> move the, the tension. Because actually... You know, there's, there's a lot of websites out there that will go through and say, here's a piece of advice. This is how you should do it because this is how I do it. And I will say that too. I will say this is how you should do it and this is how I do it because I'm right and you're wrong. But I will also say here's 5,000 words as to how I reached that conclusion. And if you don't like my conclusion, at least now you know how to think through the problem and to hit your own. The secret is I really don't care if people agree with me or disagree with me as long as I get their brains working. So, yeah, you take, you you know, that that's a, that's a good point and a, and it's very cool that you just walk them through the process. You take them through your process so that they they can either agree or disagree, but at least they know how you got to the conclusion. Right. right. And they can – sorry. No, it's okay. Do you spend much time over at Reddit? Uh, no, I do not go uh, anywhere near Reddit. I just think it would be a fun place for you. <laughs> occasionally someone will put up one of my articles on Reddit. In fact, it happens more than occasionally because I am uh, somewhat divisive and trolly as it were so occasionally i will suddenly see some traffic coming in from reddit and i'll be like oh someone posted one of my articles and i'll pop over there and watch the fight play out um which is amusing for a few comments and then the fight generally on reddit always degenerates into um, I can't listen to this guy. I don't care how smart he is because he's pretending to be an asshole or he really is an asshole. Um, or, and the other one is I can't listen to this guy because he censors his curse words. And so he's a child. You actually get that complaint, uh, censoring the, <laughs> the curse all words. All the time. All the friggin' time. I don't understand it. Like, that is... Like, that's the number two complaint I get about my content is, why do you censor your curse words? Why are you behaving like a child? 
So I won't ask you why you're behaving like a child, but why do you censor your curse words? Or do you just not curse in your regular life, in your everyday life? Oh, no, I swear like a fucking sailor on leave. But <laughs> um, it, that was a decision that I made very early on when I created the angry character who is basically just me amped up to 11. And considering I normally run at about 8, that isn't much of a jump. Um, people would be surprised to know how much of me is actually in angry. But in the end, I wanted angry to be sort of like, um, who is the, the Looney Tunes character? Yosemite Sam, mm -hmm. who's always losing his temper. He's like, oh, you're a fucking flame, flame, freaking big old But I wanted to emphasize that he was, in fact, a cartoon character. He's not a real person. You 